Fantasy High Extra Credit. I'm your humble Dungeon Master, Brendan Lee Mulligan. With me today are my very special guests, Siobhan Thompson and Lou Wilson! Hey! Hooray, hooray! Oh. Oh, holy moly, gang. We're going to start... <laughs> We're going to start, as we always do, with a couple of plugs. Remember, guys, you're watching Dropout Live here on Twitch. Monday and Friday, you got Drawfee. Wednesdays, it's D20 with our live show going back to Elmville and the Bad Kids. That's coming September 25th, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, set your cows. Light up them <laughs> Apple Watches. Scrawl and chisel on your giant stone calendars that are huge circles that tell you when the world's going to end because the world's about to begin for the Bad Kids September 25th. Fifth. Woo! Uh, uh, sophomore year, baby. Or Woo! Sophomore, year. sophomore year. Sophomore year. <laughs> sophomore year. Uh, uh, subscribe to the Twitch channel to watch D20. Um, episodes 9 through 16 are available right now. I believe episode 17 will be available next week. Um, or the new live show on demand. So if you want to see this stuff on demand. Again, how this all breaks down is everything we do that is D20 related goes to live on Dropout. So if you want it all and you want it now, you gotta go to dropout.tv. You gotta. You gotta. Um, if you watch want it. The Unsleeping City. Yes, all of The Unsleeping City is right there for you. Um, if you want to check out uh, the stuff we have on Twitch, you gotta subscribe to our Twitch channel uh, to get that VOD, that sweet, sweet VOD, and that'll be, uh, we'll have all of Fantasy High available on Twitch. Uh, I believe starting next week, we'll have uh, everything available. I could be wrong, but I believe that that's true. Um, Follow the D20 YouTube channel for even more D20. Uh, make sure to hit that bell, uh, so like and subscribe. Um, follow the ultimate D20 experience on Dropout. Uh, and again, uh, come back next Wednesday for our final talk back. Our final Fantasy High talk back will be next week. And then we're in the live show. <gasps> I'm nervous. I'm nervous too. We're going back. Um, uh, gang, holy smokes. We have just watched here on Twitch episodes 15 and 16. Some big ones, dude. Big fat abs. So, big bat. We got some thick, thick sods. Oh, dude, two C's on these abs, dude. <laughs> exactly. Abs. Maybe three. Maybe three. I'll tell you. Um, talk to me a little bit. Of, well, let's go. Let's go in order. We'll do Family and Flames first. Great. Okay. Episode 15. Um, uh, uh, we start in prison. There's an escape. The hangman grabs Bud Cubby. Yeah, oh. we got them Cubbies. Easily, I think, the best uh, returning. Like, the best, like, oh, yeah. of all the characters I expected to get us out of jail, uh, the fact that it's the Cubbies Are was... Those, were those NBC, NPCs that you made up on the fly, on the car? Fully improvised. Great. Fully improvised. They're Unreal. so much fun. I love the Cubbies so much. They're I, so cute. They're so cute. They're tiny little anarcho-socialists. Yes. I mean, I think let's make bacon is one of my favorite lines. It's of the first. The, 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 with this motion, I'll never forget. Like, it's it's cemented in my mind. All right, let's make bacon. And then, <laughs> bah, 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 bah. Like, it was like, yes. I was like, this is, this is what D&D &D allows us to do, is to save a family and then have them Save us with guns and violence. Yes, from, uh, from prison. True anti-state violence from a couple of. Inc he had a lit Molotov cocktail <laughs> in his postal worker's bag. Yes, it was, L yes. It was lit the whole time. It was lit AF. Oh. Lit, ooh, lit AF. Exactly. <laughs> I'm young. <laughs> I can't. I don't know if you can tell, but we got a loco nut here. I'm pretty young. Um, so. After that, you guys go to the school. You begin to start to unhatch the mystery of everything. Mm -hmm. You guys get these papers. We discover that Adine is the Elven Oracle. Yes. That was wild. It was very wild and truly a surprise, uh, which is ironic considering she is an Oracle. Well, you gave the first Oracle a lot of guff. Mm -hmm. You gave a lot of guff about drowning in that ship, so maybe you being surprised by the, maybe that's just how it goes for Oracles. You know, I think it's just like, you get the visions when you get them, and sometimes they're not yeah. useful. Exactly. Sometimes you get a lottery ticket, and sometimes you just get like, oh, you are wearing a green shirt. <laughs> well, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, that was, uh, uh, that was very gratifying. And uh, also, watching Brian Murphy mm -hmm. crack the, because there were a lot of clues. Yes. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. I mean, like, why are you watching this if you haven't watched these episodes? I mean, I you just watch you. them. You just watch them. If, the, if you're dropping into this and you haven't, but this is like the, your fault. This is like the big this spoiler. Is the big stuff, yeah. So, so 
uh, the, I had a lot of different clues around that Golden Horde was secretly Calvaxis, Emperor of the Red Ways. Uh -huh. you know, there were a couple little pathways to find that out. The most tedious and boring <laughs> of which were cross-referencing the employee pay stubs with the, with the like federal diversity initiative that listed the staff and faculty by species. Mm -hmm where you could look at it, see that Golden Horde wasn't on the payroll information, look over and see that there was no dragonborn working at the school and there was one non-humanoid. Uh, and that within all of that, the fact that you could actually watch Murph crack that in real time, yeah. you watch his face as he goes like, something's not adding up here. I was doing a terrible job behind the screen of just being like, <laughs> about to figure it out, uh, which is a true joy for me. Yeah. yeah, it's very fun to get to do an escape room <laughs> in real time. I, I don't know. It, 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 yeah, it's extremely gratifying. It's very, yeah. very fun. I mean, I looked at those pieces of paper and I saw nothing. Uh, <laughs> I like remember I was they, they were given to me for a second. I was like reading. And I was like, uh huh, uh huh. <laughs> Whatever, Murph, take this shit and figure something. <laughs> And look That's at a that. very Fabian Ridge. I mean, dynamic, it very though. much was like it was just like uh, Fabian's this, not going to look at this. Okay, of great, paper. great, great. Now, where does my sword go? Like it was like I don't know. I'm not going to put. I'm not going to do the math. No. Uh, but of course, Murph was just in there, dude. I do remember like hearing off in the corner when he said like whatever he whatever like that key phrase whatever he said of like. Someone's missing or something like Golden that. Golden Horde's yeah. not on here. Yeah. yeah, I think there was a discrepancy of numbers. Like there's yeah. one more person on. This yes, there was one. There was one more person on the staff than was on the payroll. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, uh, so that was really interesting. Um, there was also a. Uh, this was also the episode where we had the family in flames. Mechanic yeah. oh. had the roles for if terrible things were going to happen to your family or not. And we have here the two people that were the most on the spectrum because Fabian yep. was the first out. No question. It was so crazy when everyone started talking about it. That yeah. blew my mind. Like, from like a character perspective, I was like, I'm sorry, what? Like, you just heard your parents are in jeopardy. Like, looking back on it, yes, makes sense that you questioned it. But I was like, a lot of people who were like, Whoa, what do you think? I was like, no, like, our parents are in trouble. We know they don't. Let's get out of here. Uh, I was like, we have. To, I have to save my mom and dad. Uh, it's so wild as a DM how many times your evil little plans are thwarted. And I would say that the more cliche a villain's plan is, obviously the more ways heroes will have to mm -hmm. attempt to thwart it because it will be so familiar to them. Mm -hmm. So playing a villain that put a situation out of like, ha ha, heroes. Do what I say, or I'll hurt the ones you love. That's like every movie ever, and it never works. Mm -hmm. So I was very prepared. Like I'm about to get whomped. They're gonna do some crazy nonsense. And the fact that all of you, or the, the majority of the players, were like, "My families, I care about them," and peeled off, giving Golden Horde enough time to, you know, enact his prom ritual. Mm -hmm. I was so gleeful. I was like. Yeah. Well, we cared about those families. We cared about yeah. those families. And it was like, it should work. Yes. It should the work. The idea that I would actively go, you know what, man? I need I need this HP. Uh, like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. it, it, that is like the weird, like, what I think so many, we all, what we all do so beautifully is that, like, is that kind of losing, like, ignoring game mechanics of, like, it is like a huge deal to take all those things away. Mm -hmm. But it also is like, there's, come on, what is the in, unreal logic hole you're threading through your character's life that they're like, in this moment, my parents, they'll probably be okay. I would say in most games of D&D, &D, that thread hole is, is people having a visceral reaction to not letting a villain get what they want. Mm -hmm. But to, like, the credit but, of the... Yeah, if, if, uh, if everybody's parents had died, the villain would have gotten what he wanted. Right, exactly. Well, so, it was, yeah. And also, like... With the exception of Adine, everybody had pretty good relationships with their parents. Yeah. I mean, the only reason that Adine chooses not to do it is because it's very clear that her parents have basically already abandoned her. Mm. Brutal. Yeah, Truly I mean, emotionally brutal. abandoned her 
maybe forever ago. Maybe forever ago. As and soon as she didn't pass the entrance exam uh, into Hudol. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, speaking of which, we, uh, uh, so we have this, this mortifying thing with Ada and her family that we'll talk about also as it relates to the scene that happens afterwards mm -hmm. in 116. But uh, we have you going with Rudolfo, the magical oh, oh, Lyft driver. Yes. Uh, that name, that name, courtesy of Allie Beardsley. What's up, Allie? Um, uh, Rudolfo. Rudolfo. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, as you guys head off to go do that stuff, uh, it was heartbreaking to realize, like, oh, Adine doesn't have anyone yeah. to fight for. Um, uh, and like you giving your roles to, um, I believe it was to Allie's family, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, for Fab what was the scene like getting back Sorry, to see? Real quick, just yeah. another line of the season is the is uh, uh, Kristen's parents. Uh, do you think these are illegals? Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, oh, it was like I think like you'd all we'd all kind of been like, oh, these kind of seem like bad people. Like mm -hmm. they like, uh, but who knows? Maybe they're just misguided. That was like a nice like nail in the coffin. Like, no, 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 no. They're bad. Just because they're sweet doesn't mean that they're good. Exactly. Right. That uh, was very, because, you know, Allie was playing this character, and they were very clear. They were like, they are, like, hyper-conservative border paladin. These are not, this is like the, you know, these are, it's bad. Yeah. And uh, they effectively were like, okay, I want this relationship with my parents to be like this. And I had this hard time of being like, okay, if you're going to depict people that are not good, you mm -hmm. don't do any favors to yourself by being kind of a polemicist. Like, you don't do any favors to yourself by being like, I always hate when people are depicting someone they disagree with and make them cartoonish and right. are like, I'm clearly wrong. Yeah. And it's like, no, if they're wrong, try to make them as faithful as possible. So the idea of even playing that scene, I was like, the enemies are defeated, you know, Allie's dad is going, <sighs> yeah. and there's this moment where he looks up, and I made it the conscious choice for his facial expression to soften because he thought he was about to have a reuniting moment with his daughter, Kristen. Yeah. He thought he was about, he was like, wow, like she came back and saved us all, like incredible. And he just said the first thing that came to his mind, which was me, I was just reached in and I was like, what would he say? Because he's got no context for what just happened. Yeah. And he said, what do you think these guys are illegals? <laughs> it was, oof. <laughs> yeah. Brutal. It's hard. And the Thistle Springs in their little tank. Oh. oh. So cute. Damn. Yeah. Oh. You come to the tree, you better be ready to never leave. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, that, was, that was delightful. Um, uh, Lou, when you get to see Caster Manor, yes. what, when did you start to realize what was happening? I like got so you know because you have the whole like rolling mechanic where you rolled twice, uh, and I remember I was I always like watch it and I'm disappointed in myself because I can tell that I'm uncomfortable with how emotional it all <laughs> is. So I'm smiling the whole time. The whole time I'm just like sitting there going like, ooh, ooh. Uh, <laughs> and this like tiny weird smile and I'm like, no, this is serious and scary. Um, but I remember like getting there, and as soon as you made me make a, as soon as you made me make a choice <laughs> with regard to like going upstairs or going downstairs, I was like, "How dare you? How dare you let me have my parents? Let me save my parents?" Uh, it was I like I like even now just like thinking about it. Like when you asked me to make that choice, I was like, "Come on, Brennan, let me. Everyone else got to save their family. All right, let me save my. Let me save all my whole family." Uh, but it was, I mean, it was incredible. Like, that whole sequence is, uh, I absolutely love. From, like, from yelling at my mother to blowing up my father. Uh, yeah. That scene truly was one of my favorite. Bill's death, and the fact that that was your reforging of your father-son relationship, that you had been on the outs. Yeah. And then came back together in that moment, and him manacled Ooh. to the to the bed so that he wouldn't fall down. Uh, Stabbing people in the penis. In the butthole, shooting yeah. them in the butthole. Uh, what did he say? He said, you give you give somebody one in the brown eye, and they'll, they'll never, never forget, forget you. you dude. Um, <laughs> <Ooh>. um, <laughs> uh, and then 
when you plunged the sword of the sea casters into his heart, I can't. It's a miracle I didn't fully lose it because I was, yeah. I was amazed. I was like, <gasps> but it was perfect because yeah. we, we had foreshadowed it the whole season. I just didn't realize it. Yeah, I mean, it did. It did just seem like, I don't know what am I gonna do? Let him just slowly bleed, die. Yeah, succumb to his out? wounds. Yeah. Exactly. It's like, nah, my man wants to go out hard yeah. He's and not cough it into a handkerchief. Exactly. Oh, yeah, not like a blood. slow like. Well, head goes back, eyes roll back. I love you. Like it's like no, it's like I don't know. I kill him, like he killed his father. I, the craziest part is to think that I will one day have Fabian will one day have a son, and he will be killed. Or a daughter. Or a daughter. Or daughters can also murder their fathers. That's perfectly fair. <laughs> I actually think Fabian would prefer to have a daughter than uh -huh. like another son. Mm -hmm. um, or no, you know Fabian will go twice. Uh, I feel like kids. Fabian might have like. And children. I mean, well, that all depends on what Aylwin is thinking in terms you of. Know, I mean, you yeah, know. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we uh, uh, we get to the prom apocalypse, mm -hmm. uh, where we see the return of Calvaxis. What did you guys think seeing that? Seeing the battle set at first, were you guys like Brandon's got something else up his sleeve? A little bit, just because like. We'd fought other students and want them. Yeah. And uh, it just felt like there had to be more. And especially since I think at that point we had figured out that it was Calvaxis. Like, yeah. there's got to be more to this guy. And we uh, we knew about Calvaxis. We knew about Golden Horde. And then he just, you, they got the crown. On them both, they yep. beheld the glittering treasure. Bada bing, bada boom. Uh, putting that mini on the table is one of the most fun things. I've ever I mean, done. what a perfectly gorgeous mini. It was unreal, uh, and like so big. Yeah. Like, it was like <laughs> it like such, felt like the such kind a of macro. Thing, yeah, it's like when you're playing with like toys and you like somebody's like, well, I brought my toy. It's a very different toy and mm -hmm. it doesn't fit. It's like adding an, an action figure to a Lego set. Yeah. And it's like. <laughs> Okay, right. this is a whole new level, all right? This doesn't, this doesn't fit. Uh, I don't feel like I can defeat this. Uh, uh, yeah, it was truly wonderful when that uh, when that mini came out. Yeah, minis. Even. Shout out to Rick Perry and to Nate Villarreal, uh, uh, our lead minis painter. Yeah, They're that, so good. Uh, incredible. Um, uh, so we also in that episode have the incredible... Uh, jawbone ad iron scene. Yeah. Ooh. Ugh. Uh, that was uh, so delightful. Um, you know, we had this sort of panic attack mechanic for the character. Yeah. Uh, that had been set up for a long time, and it was uh, a way of like, uh, a having a hero of the story be someone who has a mental illness mm -hmm. as a way of like including and representing that as being something that is just a part of people's lives mm -hmm. and something that does not in any way inhibit you from being heroic. And especially when you're in high school. Yeah, that's absolutely. That's when all of that stuff like peaks, mm -hmm. I feel like. Absolutely. And you don't have the toolbox to deal with it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially what the sort of point of that scene was, which is especially if some of that toolbox is Medication yeah. that you need present parental guidance and initiative mm -hmm. to prescribe for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that was a I Jawbone is maybe my I I I have so many favorite NPCs from Fantasy High. If I could be one, if I had to live my life mm -hmm. as one of them, it would probably be Jawbone. Well, Jawbone actively helps people. Yeah. And has seen some shit and has gone through it and has gotten out the other side and is using that. His knowledge for good in a way that he doesn't need to. No, he could be very damaged yeah. and hurt, and and no one could blame him for not trying to help. Yeah. But uh, and also, I think it was a very uh, a favorite little moral of mine that he was just someone who needed a break, which I think yeah. is the case for the, like a tremendous amount of people in society and in the world in America certainly of yeah. like. Hey, I'm at this nightclub selling drugs. I have lycanthropy. I don't have health care. My situation's very bad. I'm in a fragile space. My living situation's probably not great. And it's just you guys being like, we're going to recommend you for a job at our school. And it's like, wow, that one lucky break let me kind of, I don't know. I think that a, a political and moral belief in luck is necessary 
for being a good person in this world, mm -hmm. yeah. where so much is controlled by factors outside of your conscious influence. Um, but yeah, that moment where he's like, "Has your parent?" And I think there's a great artist on Tumblr called Gray Cola or Gray Cola who, mm -hmm. who did a beautiful illustration of that yeah. scene of like, of, of he just says, "You're like running from the dragon. You have like dragon fear." And he's like, "Have you have you had panic attacks all the time?" And I remember you at the table just being like, I, like, like you said, have your parents ever given you something? And you're like, my parents ran away and I'm all alone. And I got misty. Like, it's so, it was. I made Brennan cry. Not hard to do. Um, <laughs> it was the most tears I think I'd ever seen playing D&D before. And I was like, oh, this is too. It was a lot. This Please. is real. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, I mean, I was beautiful. And I like, you know, now we cry so much at the table. Oh my but, God. But like. At, Guys. Wait for season four. Wait, I mean, you, <laughs> you guys, tears so much crying. will flow. Uh, but there was like a, I remember that was the first time I was like, wow. I mean, I like took killing my father very, I, like, mm -hmm. I feel like it's the time, I don't smile as much anymore after that, after being like, no, it's okay to be all the way in. You don't have to like remind people at home that Fabian's not me and I'm Lou and like, I'm not, like, I like, it, like it's like a, it was a nice moment of being like, we're all the way in this, and that's why we're so great. A hundred percent. And I love that, the, because in a moral about like some people, like I love that Fantasy High, which is about coming of age, depicted healthy ways of having strife with your parents and then mending those strifes, and then had other ways of saying, sometimes your relationship with your parents is toxic and mm -hmm. severing it is the best thing you can do. Yeah. And there are other people out there that will love you and will be your family. Yeah, and I think that especially in the point that Adine was at with her parents, she, that, that she has no power to change them. They're set. So if they want to change and come back to her, that's on them. But there's nothing that there's nothing more that she could possibly do. No, and it's not her responsibility. To no, uh, she's the kid. She's the kid, and and she's got Jawbone and Tracker that'll take care of her yeah. now, and uh, and she gets to live in an apartment with some werewolves. And also Kristen a lot of the time. Yeah. Speaking of which, Allie's nat 20 at the end of this episode. God damn. They are so good at perfectly timed nat 20s. Mm -hmm. It's so truly insane. It's, it's you my, guys, my impression of Allie throwing a die. We can't, there's, we can't say anything without it being spoilers, but Allie Beardsley, wherever they are, you are truly monstrous. kissed by the gods. Yeah. <laughs> Both those are true. I would kill to roll. Like they do. <laughs> They're my dice rolling inspiration. Yes. If I have a dice rolling role model, it's oh, yeah. Allie Beardsley. A, yeah, a we're, million people. Truly, we were talking uh, a few days ago about taking Allie to Vegas just so that they can win us a bunch of money. That would be. Playing craps, and we can just bet on the craps as they roll the day. That is what we're going to do. We got some questions from the Twitch. Hey, if you're hanging out in the Twitch and you're hanging out in the chat, thanks so much. We're so glad you're hey, hanging so out. So good to see you. We really dude. appreciate it. You're awesome. Uh, Ocean Ember, ooh, Ocean Ember. That question just disappeared. Can we bring Ocean Ember's question back? I was, did not read it. I think they were the most iconic think, nat, 20 nat 20 of all time. Oh, yeah. mo uh, was, was it not a question? Was it a question, think, more like, of a statement? Cool. Yeah, and I yes. vibe with that, dude. Yeah. Most iconic nat 20 of all time. I mean, you can, it's, it's asking for, and here's the thing, I would have held Allie to effectively restarting the death count. Because if going for your fourth death save after you've stabilized, yeah. to me, is going back to a state of injury, yeah. and now we're back in it again. So to me, that nat 20 is like, what an incredible, it's, it's just crazy. Matter by the second. Thanks, matter by the second. Where did the inspiration for Adine having anxiety come from? A lot of us want to know. Oh my goodness. Well, I certainly have no experience with it, so I <laughs> truly pulled it out of the ether. Uh, no, I, <laughs> uh, uh, I uh, you know, as many of us have, uh, have my issues with mental illness. Um, I had a really bad time in school uh, with depression and anxiety to the point where I dropped out of high school for a year. Um, it was bad. I had a bad time. Uh, I recently got diagnosed with ADD, which is probably where pretty much all of those problems came from. I came, I went to like pretty high stress, high pressure schools, mm -hmm. and I just could not physically do the work. Yeah. And I, I, I just, I'm dyslexic as well, and I just got so, and that got diagnosed really late, and I just got so much like 
you're so clever and articulate and good at talking in class and you have all of these good points and then you don't do your homework. I don't know what to do with you. What a disappointment. Mm. Uh, and if you hear that you're a disappointment enough times, then you're going to think that you're a disappointment. Um, and I think that in playing Adine, I kind of got to reclaim that a little bit. I'm very mm. grateful for her. Uh, for that, that I, I got to sort of replay those. I got to replay those roles, you know? Yeah. I love that. I think that's wonderful to explore those things in D&D because it is like a, uh, it's a wonderful piece of inclusion. It's a wonderful place to explore those issues in this like heroic context. Um, yeah, and people I, have panic attacks, you know? That, yeah. that's a That's a real thing. People have normal, good, healthy lives and also are anxious. Yeah. And I don't, think that it makes Adine any less heroic and I think in many ways it makes her more heroic that she's she's doing all of these mm -hmm. other things and also is constantly in terrified fear yeah um which you know I mean anxiety isn't a constant state of terrified fear but right. it's just so there present below the surface and it's almost about like how much weight is on that seesaw of like Oh, one thing can tip me over. Yeah. Instead mm -hmm. of, for most people, it's like, well, maybe 10 things will tip you over. Yes, for sure. Um, just that, that balance is off. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, you know, she's 15, 14, 15. Yeah. You don't necessarily have the toolbox then to be able to deal with that stuff, to be mm -hmm. like, this is my body. This is like, I, I can control this. I can take a moment of calm. Yeah. Most of you are like, oh, no, it, 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 this thing has taken over my body and I have no way to stop it from destroying me. Yeah. Um, no, I, I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've had a panic attack earlier this summer, and I'm Hell sure yeah. a lot of people in the... It's so fun. It's great. It's great when you're like, uh, you're like you know, something is happening to mm -hmm. my body and mind, and uh, let's just hold on. <laughs> Let's just ride this out yeah. and see what happens. Uh, Chan Free, thank you, Chan Free. I know we are all wondering, what would have happened if Ali didn't roll that natural 20? Chan Free, you know who was asking that question <laughs> as ferociously as possible in their own mind during that exact moment? Me, I was. I was the one who was wondering that. Um, I, the the honest answer was at that point Fabian had Adine on the back of the hangman. I was about to reach into her coat and try and pull out a health potion, which wouldn't have worked. Which would not and, have worked, yeah. Uh, right, because it was too valuable for the Yes, too to valuable. Work. So I don't know what I would have just been driving around avoiding dying. Probably would have been escaping from the dragon, and I think in all likelihood, what would have happened would have been like Fabian trying to escape. As horrifying as this is, there is a very real potential for a total party kill, which would not have been necessarily a very satisfying story. <laughs> but I, there is a there is a certain point at which you have to go. Okay, the dice have spoken. This is what's this is what's going on. Um, there's also a potential that that I was might have found some other way. If Fabian had gotten far enough out of town, for example, or like found the mm -hmm. like the Thistle Spring tank, the issue would have probably been that we would have taken the combat off of the prom board and just into theater of the mind. Mm. Um, which would have been kind of wild. Yeah. But that was basically it depended on Fabian surviving. That's the answer to your question. Wow, again, Fabian, <laughs> one of the most important characters. <laughs> that, that that's like so weird to hear. I don't know, I like I don't think I ever would have th thought to leave, though. I think I would have just been like driving around in circles, trying yeah. to figure out how to like get my friends up. Uh, it felt, it there would have been, been a healer somewhere. I mean, you're on a we're on a, a campus of an adventuring academy. That's yeah, healers. Sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Like, and I think was Jabba had Jabba already run in by that point. I think he was in the mouth at that point. He was in the mouth oh, to right. keep the, to keep him from using the breath weapon or something. Yes, like that. yes, yes. Keep him from biting people. That's right. So maybe Jabba would have run out and done something. Uh, it was looking bad. M. Riley 16. Thanks, M. Riley. Siobhan and Lou, what about your characters is least like you? Mm. That's um, 
great question. Yeah. I would say actually my family. Um, not that my, my family are much warmer <laughs> than the Avenets, which is a really low bar. <laughs> Not a very terrifically yeah, warm you family. Can, no. Yeah. Um, you could give a hug and win, just yes. like that, dude. Yeah, yeah. no, my, uh, my, my family are, uh, you know, have our conflicts and our differences, but um, are, are much nicer to each other. And I have a, a little sister who I'm very, very close with. Lovely. Um, Lovely. Yeah, so that, that's, I feel like, the biggest difference. Yeah, playing them was very, it was very fun. We put that, that you know, concerto music on and had this, uh -huh. this like playing this like unbelievably posh you know, uh, you know like very <laughs> elven like uh, it's it they were it was so funny because there's a lot of things that you do for comedic reasons but then you go like oh these people are monsters yeah where you know he's like I honestly Adon, I do try and you're like oh, this guy <laughs> is the worst the yeah. worst the worst yeah I mean, I certainly went to school with a lot of people whose parents were like that. Ugh. Yeah, horrifying. No good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the easiest answer is just body type. <laughs> I don't have, I don't have this. Uh, this is not in my <laughs> caliber. I, my body, I don't have all of those muscles. I don't know. I mean, like, it's weird though, because I feel like a lot of the, like, I, I think Fabian and I are confident in the same, I was going to say confidence, but I think me and Fabian are confident in the same way mm -hmm. of like, it's all like show. If you were like, hey, shut up, like tell mm -hmm. me your truths, I think like Fabian and I would have similar reactions of just being like, um, what? uh, but yeah, I think between body type and I was nowhere near as rich as Fabian. Uh, Fabian's <laughs> like, I think uh, on a, in appearances, everything, I wanted to be in high school, which was rich and hot. Uh, yeah. There you go. That's the part oh, of Oh, yeah, the, ri <laughs> the rich kids. Yeah, I was the rich, hot kid, dude. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, these, we these are the our two. Kids, you were the dude. rich kids. That's right. That's absolutely yes. right. I yeah. love that. Uh, and I love it was very funny, too, because you did have, like, a nouveau riche versus, like, old, old money, money yes. uh, attitude, which is very, very funny. Um, Geek Act 2625 asks, would you consider doing a Dimension 20 campaign or side quest with a strong female protagonist crossover or similar oh, setting? My okay. webcomic. Well, I'll tell you what. Before I did that, I would finish strong female protagonist. To everyone that reads the webcomic and is waiting for an update, myself and Molly have been incredibly busy. I've been working at College Humor doing Dimension 20. Molly's been writing for Disney shows and uh, killing it and releasing books. Go out and buy Molly's The Witch Boy series. It's incredible. Uh, so we are very sorry that we have not gotten a chance to return back to SFP. We are going to. We are going to. It's just about finding that mystical, magical window of time where that can happen. Uh, that being said, I would love to do an SFP crossover. I would love to do. I've had a couple little things where we like know some of the know some of the people. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to say nothing, but um, if anyone here has ever heard of Starstruck, written by my mom Elaine Lee, uh, that's name drop. Name drop. Uh, go check out Starstruck, uh, incredible, groundbreaking, revolutionary graphic novel series by Elaine Lee and Michael Kaluta. Uh, that's always struck me as like, oh, if I could ever like play a sci-fi tabletop game, if not in Dimension 20, then some, somewhere, somehow, mm -hmm. uh, that would be cool as hell. Um, Unigoat JJ. Thanks, Unigoat JJ. Uh, uh, German for <laughs> one goat. Um, <laughs> What? What? Absolutely incorrect. <laughs> so no, many I'm doing. Wrong. I'm doing a reference to an ancient SNL thing where Jimmy Fallon says Unimog German Ancients? for one. That's not from right. the dawn of time when <laughs> Tina Fey and Jimmy Fallon were co-anchoring <laughs> Weekend Update. 1999. Uh, what was slash is the deal with that one student that stayed in the gymnasium throughout the whole fight? <laughs> oh yeah, the one that's eating the food the whole yeah. time. I'm glad you asked. Maybe he could have healed us. Yeah, what if he had just had a like, like, a, like six level heal, mass heal, healing heal, word? Heal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That student uh, was secretly um, the Elven Oracle. The, she never died. She was hidden. Disguised. Wow. That's how I found out. All that's right. How you found out. Wow. Okay. Uh, no, that's demoted. No, uh, some things are just as they appear. Uh, uh, there's no secret mystery to who that student was. That student's name was. Gem peppercorn. Gem? 
Jim Peppercorn, J E M Jim Peppercorn, and they uh, are a type of earth elemental that only eats once a year, and they have to get all the food in in 20 minutes for the whole year. There you go. There you go. Are you canon. satisfied That's with canon. that answer? That's canon. Are you? Canon. 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 Uh, Bard in the yard. Bard in the yard. Bard in the yard. Get in, get in the dang house. <laughs> Come inside. Come inside. It's, it's 50 to 50 hogs out in exactly. that yard. Get in there. Get in there. <laughs> Thanks, Bard in the yard. Brendad, Siobhan, and Lou. What was the first D? People call me Brendad. Yeah, That's it's what cute. That is. Yeah. Um, we got it. We got it. Yeah, did you not get it? I w I'm trying to help. <laughs> we you, got it. We Chris all not. got it, dude. Woof. <laughs> what was the first D and D adventure you played, and how have you evolved the most as a player slash DM to what we're seeing now? Mm. Um, my first, I think that we're it's actually the the same campaign setting because we're both playing with Brennan that is in Ariel. Uh, I mean, oh, it's not is, my first. Uh, That's is, my first with Brennan. Oh. Uh, uh, so yeah, we were playing a three point five campaign for a long time that we just changed over to five E because every time we went back, we only play now every two or three months. Mm -hmm. And every time we would dip back into 3.5, we'd be like, who is, what is this? What are these things Yeah. mean? Gra what is this grapple? Will save stuff? I don't Fortitude, I don't remember. reflex? Um, so, but uh, that game is me, Emily, Murph, Zach, and then a couple of our buddies, uh, Travis Helwig and John Wolf. Um, and I play a... Uh, uh, ranger, I play half uh, elven, half elven ranger called Rhiannon the Giddy. Uh, Good it's, name. Uh, she's not giddy at all. She's she's very serious. But mm -hmm. um, the other half of her is a Kildarian, and they're very conservative, stoic, very human, uh, very r racist, mean people. Yes, correct. They're nasty, gothic, uh, Transylvanian stuff. They're like yeah. oh, you know deep, thick forests in the mm -hmm. mountains, full of wolves mm -hmm. and. People are not trustworthy in the Everything is slightly twi twilight all the time. Twilight, mm. exactly. Um, it's very fun. Um, uh, it's a hoot. And then, yeah. Lou, what was your first campaign? My first campaign, which I don't think we've ever really gotten into, because it's probably, it's so crazy, because it's probably even before, whatever I was playing was way before 3.5. I played, uh, my elementary school was very, like, new agey and hippie. Uh, and there, once a year, they had these things called options, which was essentially like an activity that was offered up by a community member, whether it be student or parent, to like give to the like kids of the school. And so I took a D and D option when I was in fifth grade. Oh wow! Uh, so in wow. fifth grade, I played D and D, and I don't. I know I played some kind of fighter. I didn't have like powers, uh, but I played some kind of fighter. And uh, I, I tell you, I've changed, uh, evolved immensely, because I, what I do 100% remember is that in my very first D&D session, we were like showing up in a town, and I asked if, I remember some bad stuff happened, and I hid in a barrel, and then once the bad stuff passed, I got out of the barrel, and I asked the DM if I could get a job. <laughs> and I got a job at a bakery. <laughs> Uh, Never and, fighting at all. And for the first, Just the sweet for my boy. first ever session of D and D, I had a job at a bakery. The idea of like some monster, some dragon passes overhead. You pop out of a barrel and go, oh, I need to get a job. <laughs> that is I exactly. gotta leave this adventuring life behind. <laughs> I a hundred percent. Everybody else went on an adventure. Everyone else and you were started. Like, I remember waking it being up a at whole five thing. In the morning. Like it's coming back to me. It's like I don't remember all of it, but I do. Remember, like it was moments of. Him narrating them going and talking to the king and being they him being like you guys need to deal with this and him the cutting and then me being like well what about me at the bakery and he's like you did an okay job you got paid one gold piece and I'm like yeah one gold piece for a day's work in a bakery <laughs> was this the capital my god this economy Ooh. is shot uh but that's so I've changed a lot I don't work uh I don't get uh, menial labor uh when uh dangers afoot. Uh, maybe season seven. Maybe season I seven dude. Would I honestly would die to play that. If you just split the time evenly between people so it's like okay <laughs> we're with the other five people for twenty you know twenty five <laughs> minutes and then we cut over for five minutes and we're like an order's just come in. <laughs> A woman wants eight raisin cinnamon loaves and she wants them by tonight and you don't have the ingredients. Roll for yeast proof. <laughs> <laughs> Underproved, overworked. <laughs> um, 
Uh, that's amazing. Uh, uh, my first campaign that I ever played in, I was 10 years old. Uh, my mom put up a notice for like D&D &D groups in October Country in New Paltz, which I, uh, I swung by October Country. I was back home visiting family. Uh, we swung by October Country, and I bought two dice. I bought some dice from my first little game shop. It was lovely. Um, uh, but I put, a, I put up a notice there in my mom when I was 10 years old. And uh, I went and played with a bunch of these very generous with their time, like 20-somethings, who were willing to like take in a kid who wanted to learn, which is very ki kind, very kind of them to do. Teach the children how to learn to play. Teach children how to learn to play. And I made a bard, and they were like, that's a hard class to play, and it's not fun. You should be a fighter. And I was like, no, I wish to sing. <laughs> and I wrote a bunch of songs and rhymes, and I was like making up stuff. And I remember I immediately did a thing that I have always done mm -hmm. when I'm not careful that, that makes people mad, which was like read into things too much. And it makes DMs mad if you do it and they don't want you to. So we, we were like, there were like fire giants around. I was a first level character in a thing with fire giants. It was crazy. But the, my character w said something where it was like, um, it was this thing where, uh, there were huge barrels of kerosene everywhere uh, that would explode. And my character was like, these giants are planning war. Why else would they keep so much of this flammable liquid where anyone could find it? We must warn the king. And what it is is the DM just wanted barrels to blow up. There yeah. was no world building logic to it. And they just got pissed that this little kid was like, there's enormous holes throughout all of the world building here. I, I'm going to resolve the logic of them on, on my own dime. Uh, uh, and my character got turned into a frog by a gorgon. Ooh. And then rocks fell on you. And then rocks fell and I died. Rocks fall, everybody dies. Cutest kitten too. Thanks, cutest kitten too. Uh, uh, for Siobhan, knowing that you're a big theater mm. fan, are there specific people who serve as the inspiration for Misty Moore? For sure. I mean, she's definitely like a, a mishmash of people. Uh, Elaine Stritch, obviously, is one. Bette Midler. Um, oh, God. Uh, Patti Lapone. There mm. is an incredible, if you want to listen to a real fun, insane theater interview, on Alec Baldwin's old podcast that I don't think he does anymore. He interviews Patti Lapone, and it's just too... Long Island snobs trying to out snob each other, and they spend the whole time talking about doing David plays, David Mamet, of course. They don't say David Mamet. They don't say Mamet plays. They say, "Oh, I was doing a David play in Williamstown." <laughs> oh, David! Oh, is it doing a David play at the public? Oh, I love David. It is truly an impeccable piece of drama. Uh, <laughs> um. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many incredible old Broadway legends. Uh, Carol it, Channing, yes. uh, for sure. You can't do New York. It's it's one of those it's one of those great things where I think um, doing a New York story. Mm -hmm. I want to be very cognizant of like let's not just do the New York that tourists see. Let's do the new like real people, real communities, the actual people that live in New York. But then it's like, but also a huge percentage of New York is the New York that tourists see. And yeah. it is the, mm -hmm. and like, you can't really do, like, do New York without having that one old, old, old rich lady who's crazy is. There's so many old rich people that are crazy in New York City. It's wild. They're so old and so rich and so crazy. It's, you cannot walk, uh, like if you walk up Central Park on the east side, mm -hmm. you cannot, or actually even, oh. The amount of hats. Huge hats. Just so many different flavors of hats. Just, I, there, there are two more influences that I just remembered. Yeah. One is uh, Ripley and Skinner live at Town Hall. Uh, fantastic, just like a live, fun live album uh, of uh, Alice Ripley and Emily Skinner just out diva each other, which is great. And then when I worked at ABC Kitchen in New York City, there were these three women that would come in who were just sort of doing Liza Minnelli impressions, it felt like. Mm. And they would wear these fabulous hats. Uh, and just there was a lot of this. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> doing that naturally takes, I feel like, just years of training. Truly. You just have to be like, no, 
no, I know that my body doesn't want to do this, no. and everyone is looking at me and is confused, but this is who I am. Beautiful. Bring me water, bring me bread. <laughs> da, da, da. Yeah, just an exhausting amount of being on at yeah. all yeah. times. Constantly. Uh, I love it. Kiffy Arts. Thanks, Kiffy Arts. Uh, if Fabian had chosen to go after Bill Seacaster first instead of his mother, what would have happened to his mother? In fact, what would have happened to Bill? I'm going to answer this in two parts. The first part is, in no world does Fabian go after Bill before he goes after his mother. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any second I, I, yeah. It would have been the largest betrayal of character ever. There are certain things as a D, because a lot of people, there's, a, there's a, people love to ask what if questions about, mm -hmm. like, what would you have done if this? And it is funny because I do advocate a lot for improvisation and being like, you gotta roll with the punches. The PCs are gonna do things that you'd never anticipate. That's true, but something that doesn't get said sometimes is, there are also things that I've been doing this for long enough that I can just bank on. Yeah. Fabian's gonna get his mom, right? Uh, even though there's a thing that like bounced around the internet of me talking about someone being like, how did you know that Adine was going to get a magic book? And I was like, because you mentioned there's a magic book. Who's not going to get to steal that magic book? got to steal that magic book. got to steal that magic book. Um, in terms of what would have happened story-wise in the, in the logic of the world is that Hilariel would be dead. They yeah. would have, they would have bumped it, would, it into and the And then pod. you would be dead because your dad would have killed you oh, yeah, for going after him yeah. instead so, of your mom. So, so Cthilda would be dead and Hilariel's uh, sensory <sighs> deprivation <sighs> egg would have been smashed. <laughs> Cthilda, your real mother. <laughs> exactly. Uh, my actual sub provider. Yeah, uh, yes, actual provider. Right, sir, Kippers. Um, uh, 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 that's the question. Uh, Asan M. Bryant 1. Thank you, Asan M. Bryant 1. Question for Lou. Fabian has some things going on with his father, but it's also quite different. How do you picture Fabian as a mature adult? Oh, uh, great question. Uh, I mean, I think like it's it it feels like a, maybe a more even more muted Bill Seacaster of like you still have this like adventurous spirit, mm -hmm. uh, but how actively that is enacted, uh, I think it's like it's it you just wouldn't see it as much. He would still have all the veracity and confidence and uh, that he had as a younger man, but in terms of like the actions and choices that he makes, I think they would be more reasonable and thoughtful with regard to those that he loved. It's like a second gen Kennedy. <laughs> like, exactly. Bill C. Caster is, is the bootlegger, and yes. then you went to a good school. And exactly. I might, that yeah, I, might, I might run for office or be head. Yeah. I do feel like Fabian would be like high up if like this were. Our world, Fabian would be like, would run a company, but not because he like earned it, mm -hmm. uh, right. but because he just got uh, like, right. Put somebody there. asked him to. I feel exactly. Like. But he still would, like, it's like he, you just seem so confident. But he still like crushes it. You know, right, it's like, right, right, right. He didn't earn it, but he's still good at it. Yeah. That's the funniest thing too is I feel like you see this a lot. Like I used to weirdly, I was thinking about it because we we're talking about old rich ladies in New York. I used to do catering there, and I remember going to these these like catering at parties where there'd be big benefits and you would see these couples mm -hmm. that would be like old captain of industry men who were like kind of like pug faced and all like you know like a robber baron type like I made my fortune by murdering the poor <laughs> yeah. and then you would see their beautiful like trophy wives for mm -hmm. lack of a better term it's not a it's a, a, a the term that is I'm not a fan of, but you know what I mean? They'd be like the, the beautiful woman on their arm that they had married. It's I mean, like, that's how they're treating them. Right, exactly. But you'd see this beautiful woman, and then you'd see their daughters, and I would, was, would talk with my friends and be like, look at, look at like the daughter of the guy who's running this benefit, and you'd be like the most beautiful woman in the world who has these sharp, predatory eyes. Mm -hmm. and you're like, ooh, you got the dad stuff and the yeah. Yeah. mom stuff. And I think that, to me, is, is Fabian mm -hmm. to a T of like all of the refinement and charm and class of his mom with the like like undying ferocity and like I will literally reach up and grab the sun out of the sky yeah. right. of Bill Seacaster. It's that George Bernard Shaw, that famous George Bernard Shaw quote, a beautiful woman came up to him at a party and said, we should have children because they'll have your brains and my looks. And he says, yes, but what if you have, they have my looks and your brains. <laughs> right, uh, yeah. You know yeah, exactly. Like, no, there's. I think I misquoted that, but but I exactly. Yeah, cool. exactly. Yeah, we got yeah, yeah, you yeah, get yeah, it. You yeah, can yeah, look yeah. it up. You have the internet. Uh, no. no, but I feel very. I I think that's uh, uh, 
But also, Fabian is not as much of a loner as Bill was. No. Um, I have friends. You have friends. Yes. Not. And you don't have to be the boss. You, exactly. you don't have to be the captain. I don't have to be the captain. Um, I love that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Tempest Trina. Thanks, Tempest Trina. Siobhan slash Adine's thoughts on Fabian's rescue mission he wants to do for Aelwyn. Would she join? Absolutely not under any circumstances. Oh. Like, that truly is maybe the one thing that will tear us apart as a friendship group. That, <laughs> that is our Captain America Civil War moment. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Where because, half of us go with me yeah. and half of us, oh. Go, go to undermine you from doing it. Yes. She's objectively bad. Yeah, I know. I, un I yeah, you know, yeah. but you just want, I get it. She's, she's like my dad, that I, but I can have sex with yes. her. Uh, I'm not, you know. Yeah, no, I not, get it. Yeah. Uh, but, but is she is she all the way bad? Yeah, though? no, she is. She's is fully she? all the way bad. Is she? She's irredeemably bad. If you feel like she's not irredeemably bad, go ahead and get in the comments. If go you feel like she is irredeemably bad, say Siobhan is right about everything. <laughs> Uh, go ahead and just put uh, the letter A for Aylwin if you think she's good. I'm gonna get a lot more because Come on, let's go, man. everyone. Come, Come on. on. Come I made on. mine We're easier. Turn the tide. Democracy's about logistics, baby. <laughs> Samuel Wolf, thank you, Moo. Samuel Wolf. Did you ever expect Dimension 20 to be as successful as it is? It not only got me into D&D, but I started DMing because you guys are so inspirational. That slaps. That's great. I'm so glad you're doing this game. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah, no, we had no idea. We Not were playing time. like, I mean, we're having a good time. Sure. I, I'm, I'm entertained. Yes. Will anybody want to watch this? Who knows? Yeah. When you asked me to do this, I was like, I'm sorry, people do this? <laughs> this, is a, this is a genre. We're not pioneers in trying to convince people to watch three hours of people talking. Yeah. Um, well, people watch three hours of people talking famously, and they have yeah. for yeah. thousands of years. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's just a we new We are the of... Greek uh, <laughs> gods of our era. <laughs> um, uh, uh, no, I, you, you'd be really, well, first of all, thank you for yeah. your, no, your yeah. suggestion it's... that we are as successful as it is, which is implying that it's very successful. I, I think that, look, this show is successful if people keep wanting to watch it and we yeah. get keep getting to make on it the only bar on this pole vault for me was can we keep coming back and doing more of it and you guys have made that possible yeah from the bottom of my heart i will never be able to thank you guys enough for watching this show the fact that i get to play with my best friends and do it's, it's unreal so delightful it's wild um uh but you know and you'd be you'd be crazy to expect this any decent person with enough humility to walk through the world Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as a as a good human being, would not be like you know what's probably gonna happen. My D and D show is gonna crush. <laughs> no, I didn't right. anticipate that. It's been an incredible surprise and a dream come true. So thank you very very much. Um, Smaug in thank the Tardis. Thank you. Siobhan is right about every goddamn thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. They're choosing what they show us. Show us all the A's. No. Show no, us the no. thousands of A's. Absolutely. Not. I know they're out there. <laughs> She is irredeemable. Smaug in the TARDIS. Sh shout out to someone doing a cool mashup of Middle Earth and Doctor Who there. Yeah. Uh, Silent Chief 52. Thanks, Silent Chief 52. Brennan, which PC screwed you over the most in Fantasy High? Riz Guckgack shooting Daybreak in the head. That's the answer to that question. Yep. I had to rewrite everything on the fly real quick. Um, uh, only because of our shooting schedule, I think. Um, because if that was on a Wednesday and I need to be ready by Friday. Um, and uh, but you know no one ever no one ever screws me. No, we weren't. That was not a thing that was like let's mess with Brennan. Yeah, yeah. that was a logic. That was also Riz logic. That was yes. the scariest moment I think. <laughs> well, easily, people getting shot in this series was is was always intense. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. That one was crazy because it was also like this thing of like all of us being like, oh come on. Come on, Riz. We don't really have to. And he was like, no, I point a gun at, at the back of this gun Teacher's Smith head. hand, and I pull the trigger. Yeah, um. 100%. 100%. True. Uh, uh, of all, the, of all the, the PCs, yeah, Riz just going full Punisher was wild. <laughs> uh, Pro Joseph. Thanks, Pro Joseph. A. Yay. That's a big old A from Pro Joseph. Right. There you go, Pro Joseph. Only one of those counts, though, so you can keep <laughs> <cycling>. <laughs> uh, 
to disqualify that ballot. <laughs> nerdy Nerd 52. Uh, thanks, Nerdy Nerd 52. What's the most difficult part of character creation? The math. I wouldn't know. The math is the hardest the part math? of character creation. Well, the math is the hardest part. Oh, yeah, part. adding all those things. I think it's like, for me, it's like coming up with amazing ideas. Yeah. Picturing them, how they work with, with regard to other people's ideas. Right, yeah, finding a character that's going to have that's going to be fun for me to play, yeah. that has a specific enough game that everybody gets it immediately, but not so specific a game that it gets tired very quickly. Yes. Uh. Yeah. I know from my perspective as a DM that when you guys submit multiple ideas for characters, the mm -hmm. thing that's guiding me the most is often, um, does this character illuminate a part of the setting that I want to have illuminated? Mm -hmm. And do they, through their emotionality and personality, hit on themes that are gonna be in the story? Like if you're trying to tell a dark, twisted story, and someone's like, I'm playing a funny, happy-go-lucky, you, you can kind of go like, ooh, like, like, as a DM, I'm looking for which one is gonna cast the most light on the setting, mm -hmm. and then also kind of, you know, I know what the amusement park is like, so which of your characters is going to have the most fun on these rides? Right. You know? Yeah, for, uh, for Fantasy High, I came in very strong. Like, I have this idea. Mm -hmm. I don't have any I other ideas. Everybody else can figure out their stuff around mm -hmm. me because this is the idea that I have. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the Unsleeping City, the other idea that I had, that I came in with, was like a East village crust punk rogue yeah which i think would also have been very fun to play but there was a space in that group for a bard yes like i think it made like either of those characters being equally fun to play you go with like how is this how, what is the dynamic of this group and as a perfect example of that the rogue i knew i was like oh siobhan would have a lot of fun playing that rogue character between two equal choices, mm -hmm. the rogue character is illuminating a part of the city halfway between Pete and Kugrash. Right. And Misty is illuminating a part of the setting that if she's not present in the campaign, right. will go unnoticed. We'll mm -hmm. never go to Broadway. We'll never see that performance art side of the, or that, that performance side of the city. And that'll be a bummer. We will yeah. like, miss out on that. Um, and I think that when you're DMing or making characters at home, I think that as a, even as a PC, when you're doing character creation, looking around and being like, my brother ran this awesome pirate campaign, and during character creation, nobody was making a pirate. And I was like, well, damn, I'm not gonna let my brother make this campaign and have nobody be a pirate. Yeah. So I think you can, when you, if you're making PCs, look at the story that your DM's excited to tell, and I think you can go like, oh, we're doing like a weird, like, you know, haunted fairy tales setting. No one's being like a, big bad wolf or like a wolf hunter lumberjack, I gotta be that. No one's being a weird Pied Piper bard. Well, how are we gonna do fairy tales and not do, you know, so there's that element of like. We should do a fairy tales one that's fun. I would love to play Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack and the Beanstalk? I'm, I'm claiming it now before Ali has a chance. We, this might be uh, season seven. Um, and I would be the, well, I'd be, I'd be Rip Van Winkle. <laughs> No, no, what's the Too name? late, can no, 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 You're asleep the no, whole campaign. Sorry, dude. No, please. Bomber, man. No, you no. own this. Your no. mistake. I Only to... you Rumble did this. Only. I oh, Rumpelstiltskin? Yeah. Well, did you say Rumpelstiltskin? No, or did you say Rip Van Winkle? You sleepy <laughs> You. Can I, what if I slept the whole time? The whole time. Woke up last We're going to cut over and Rick God. Perry's going to make your beard a little longer. Your beard's going to get incrementally longer oh my session God. after session. And I'm going to play Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> Guess my name. Oh my God. Uh, hot, hot, hot liquid jello. Uh, thanks, hot liquid jello. Hashtag question for Brennan. What's a philosophical query you want to explore in a TTRPG but have not yet had the chance? Ooh. Um, thanks, Hot Liquid Jello. Artful. There are so many great philosophical mm -hmm. queries to explore. Everything for me always comes back to axiology and ethics in particular. 
Uh, trolley game? I feel like we haven't done a trolley game. We haven't done a trolley game, I yeah. feel like. We have not. Um, there is an element to... Uh, phil I love philosophy. I, I formally studied philosophy in college. Uh, but the vast majority of philosophy is, I think, um, impractical, like navel-gazing. A lot. There's a lot of metaphysics and epistemology that, while it's like extremely fascinating on an academic level, is not as immediately useful as ethics. And I think if you look at the current state of the world, you would be hard pressed to not say that we are in a uh, moral crisis where, uh, straight up, our ability to make ethical utilitarian decisions that benefit the most people has not kept up as fast as our advancements in other spheres of human thought, like technology and various other academic mm -hmm. studies. Uh, it's a bummer. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons yeah, for that. Yeah, if you work in tech, please study ethics. That's important. <laughs> right. Ethics is truly important. And uh, the fact that we like are grappling with you know, all these huge global issues that require advanced ethical consideration and thought uh, is really significant and important. So I love uh, including ethics in TTRPGs. And in fact, you can't play a game that's about choice making and getting involved in narrative and characters without having those. In terms of queries that are important, Look, I think that Fantasy High was a lot about coming of age, which has its very, uh, and about identity, uh, which has a lot of ethical attachments to it. I think Unsleeping City is very obviously about duality. It's really interesting that in old versions of D&D, &D, there are tons of um, campaigns centered around law versus chaos rather than good versus evil in terms of the alignment spectrum. And to me, a lot of the setup for the Unsleeping City is almost about, and I don't want to give any, I don't think this is a spoiler to say this, but when I was designing the setting after these guys had made their PCs, so designing mm -hmm. it around their PCs, I was sort of like, um, wouldn't it be interesting to do a setting that had an active threat of evil in it, but that our good guys were split along a really intense law versus chaos spectrum? Um, and I think that the disagreements between Kingston and Pete, the, and even like the, the various like sides of the table are kind of affiliated on law to chaos. Right, which, it's it's a true spectrum on that table, which is very fun. Which is really really fun because you have people like Pete and Misty that are clearly beings of dream energy, which kind of stands in for chaos, and then you have people of the waking world that is very clearly like the law side of things. What I love about that too also is that law in that setting is very like cool. Like Kingston's a cool character. Yeah, and Depictions yeah, it's, of, it's very rare to have a lawful character that's also cool. Exactly. And to me, as someone who I certainly identify lawful in my life, it's like, oh, the, the, like, the stuffy, rules-focused paladin is not, is not what law is about. Right. To and, have the stuffy, rules-focused paladin to be a hot dummy. <laughs> right. To be a hot dummy is great. Zach is so good at playing hot dummies. He really is. I think I might play a hot dummy next. Who knows? Oh, yes, that's dude. Great. Who knows? Jump out of your comfort zone. Right? Um, but yeah, in, in my, in my <laughs> head, law is not about, uh, in this setting. As like a, as like a PC, not, yeah. not like, yeah, yeah. you, uh, <laughs> hey, uh, this is a great stream. I'll see you <laughs> 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 um, Yeah, but the idea of having like a lawful character that where law, it means harmony, community, and things, uh, like cooperation and coordination is what is meant by law. It's very uh, fun to me. Um, uh, so, to answer your question, God, there's so many. Uh, uh, maybe I'll do one on the trolley problem. Maybe I'll do one on... Uh, How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Yeah. Real quick, what is a trolley... Because somebody asked it and I had the same question. What is a trolley game? Whoa, okay. Ooh. So here's the deal. You're... Is it, are we about to spend the last 15 minutes yes. of this talk? Okay. <laughs> You're on a trolley. It's unstoppable. You can go left or right. Left, there's one person. Right, there's four people. You're going to kill either one person okay. or four, per four people. I now know the trolley game, yes. Uh, uh, but you know the person who's one person. You don't know the people who's four people. Really? That's, that's another way, step. That's, that's another. That, there's many the different steps. The way I heard it, isn't yes. like I thought. I now that we're saying it, isn't it like eight questions? Yeah. Is it's it's a bunch, a bunch there's of so many different kinds of trolley problems. The yeah. one I always heard was you're standing off to the side of the tracks. The trolley is barreling towards one person. You haven't done anything. The tr uh, sorry, no. The trolley is barreling towards four people. Mm -hmm. It's barreling towards four people. It's going to kill them. It's going to kill four people. It has nothing to do with you. You could pull a lever to divert the trolley onto a track where it would kill one person, thus saving the four people. 
but you would have pulled the lever condemning that person to die. The, for me, the obvious answer is save the four people, kill the one person. You got to do it. Uh, uh, but it's about it's about whether it's basically that version of the trolley problem is about whether inaction counts as action. And much like Spider Man in the MCU, mm -hmm. uh, I also believe you if you are powerful enough to stop things and you let them happen, you did them. Yeah, that's my personal belief. There's lots of that kind of stuff in the philosophy of archaeology, which I really love. Of mm -hmm. like the one that I always go back to is like, what is material culture? Is an apple material culture? Like, a knife is material culture. Is an apple material culture? Well, if you, once you pick it from the tree, does that make it material culture? Well, a human grew this apple tree from a branch that they cut from another apple tree. Does that mean that it's material culture? Or is it still natural? You know, like, yeah. at what step is that line drawn? drawn? Uh, we're going to do an archaeology season. Hell confirmed yeah. here. Oh my god, uh, I'm gonna kill it. Yeah, can we do one that's just a we play six philosophers at a table <laughs> and every episode is just us sitting at a table. Oh my god. And the combat it's episodes just a Carol just, Churchill play. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. I the love combats it. are just, yeah, who can who can be the most yeah, exactly. philosophical? <laughs> we take oh, good point. psychic good damage. Point. Oh, I was proven wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, the state Arizona. The whole state. The whole state. Oh, Thanks, wow. the state Arizona. We love your teas. What do you do when a player forgets the established background of other characters in the setting? What's the weirdest, funniest thing you've seen because of that? Um, Allie Beardsley will while <laughs> off and create details about the setting. Kristen being part of the Harvest Men was not agreed upon backstory. And while they were talking about that, they were like, oh, yeah, like, I'm. Yeah, I've, like, like, they said, like, I've been to their festivals. Been to their right? festivals. I was behind the screen being like, do tell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but it, I, I rolled with all of it because it was all awesome. Um, I think if it ever actually contradicted something that I needed to be true, I would probably step in and say, well, maybe something else. Uh, but that hasn't come up yet. There was definitely a moment in The Unsleeping City, which is a spoiler, which I'm gonna... Not a spoiler. This episode's already happened. Oh, yeah, great. It's been out. Uh, that in the first episode, I think I, as a bit, said, oh, you can take the train, but you, you can have take to take the L train, L train to you have to go past Canarsie. It's a whole thing. Um, and then when we got, I said that as a bit. Yeah. And then we got there, and it took me such a long time to realize what train we had to get on, because I truly was like, but I said that as a bit. Yeah. And they built the sets already. So that can't be true, because they already built the sets, and I said this as a bit. Yeah. Now, to be fair, that bit was stacked in my favor a little bit, because we did both live off that train stop. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's true, right around the corner. But uh, it was still like... Incredible. Well, when you said that, I'm the first thing I did is like, as I went, can we? Ch I was like, can we make the? Because we hadn't decided what the train was going to be from yet. Oh, okay. I was like, uh, was we had the the set was built, but we could easily change the like um, the signage the signage of the trains. We were like, make that uh, the app. It was a magic trick, and I got got. Whoa. Gotcha. Magic. Uh, Amyaka spent Gladiator one. Which, thank you, Amyaka Spent. I think it's Amy, a.k.a. Spent Gladiator 1. Um, I like Amyaka. <laughs> um, but uh, Amyaka might be right. Amyaka. I, I Amyaka, no I'm judgment. so sorry. <laughs> Siobhan's insensitivity will not stand. Uh, I apologize on behalf of my people in my country. <laughs> uh, uh, which, thank you for your question. Which Dimension 20 NPC would you like to hang out with the most? Also, A. God. A. 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 Dang A. it. A. A. Um. um uh, NPC. NPC. And it's Dimension 20. It's not Fantasy High. So we got all Ooh, the way through wow. on Sleeping City episode 11. I mean, got to say 10. 7. That guy seems so much fun. Um, <laughs> uh, ooh, um, It's tough. God, that's tough. There really are a lot of fun ones. But also a lot that are like... Fun, fun for one scene, but do you really want to hang out with yeah. him? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to meet Buddy the Shit Elemental, but I'm not sure <laughs> I'd want to hang out right. with Buddy the Shit Elemental. Yeah, I mean, probably Tracker and Jawbone. They seem like a mm. fun hang. They're yeah. the most human of the NPCs. Like, yeah. Jawbone is genuinely grounded. nice and wa and wants to make sure the people that he's with are having a good time. Yes. Um, uh, and also, it has rad stories about stuff that happened in his crazy life. Yeah. Um, uh, um, which the ice cream? Santa, Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, look. Yeah. I guess. Oh, sure. Santa, yeah, yeah, I would like to meet Santa right. Claus. Yeah, that's cool. I guess you could. I you know, 
I mean, and I don't think this is a spoiler. I think you could also hang out with, uh, I mean, no, nah, yeah, I'm going to go Santa Claus. I also Santa feel Claus. like Esther Sinclair and I would just be friends. Esther's very, I would yeah. love to hang out with Esther. Esther's very cool. Yeah. If I hung out with Esther, she might teach me magic, which would be Yeah, rad. that would be that also would be extremely cool. very rad. Uh, uh, Alejandro, same reason. Would love yeah. to yeah. hang with Alejandro. Um, nerdy Dragon Cat. Thanks, Nerdy Dragon Cat. Sense Tracker is also a cleric. What kind of form would her spirit guardians take? Ooh. Also, would the philosophy students, professors, be able to interact with them? Yes. Uh, uh, Tracker is a priestess of the moon. She worships the moon. So her spirit guardians would probably, if I were going to come up with something off the top of my dome, probably be Stevie Nicks. What's that? Stevie Nicks. It's just a bunch of Stevie Nicks. It's Stevie Nicks cloning herself like multiple man from the X-Men. Uh, just potentially thousands of Stevie Nickses. Like the white winged dove. Um, <laughs> uh, that or like cool ancestral primal like Celtic werewolf. Like I'm thinking like painted werewolves with like, oh, like cool woad color. Woad colors, colors and like, torques and like spears like yeah, with wrapped cool. copper on them and stuff. That's very dope. Um, uh, Stelaka one. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Stelaka one. Did you always plan on having the musical being a big part of the Unsleeping City setting before Misty was created? That's a great question. I present a pretty volcanic campaign setting to my PCs because I want to incorporate as much of their character choices as possible baked into the fabric of the world around them. So I don't start designing battle sets for these seasons until after I know who the main six PCs are going to be. Yeah, um, I mean, all we get is, hey, it's magical high school. It's yeah. uh, magical underground in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, for season five, there was like slightly more. We'll, yeah. you know, that's spoilers. We won't go into that. But, you know, it's like there's, there's, um, there's a lot of material that like is cooked up after the fact. Because I also, it's also the kind of thing where I don't want to be like, hey, I've like mapped out all the different gods and pantheons of this, and mm -hmm. then nobody's proficient in religion, and no one's playing a cleric or paladin. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, ooh, I wasted a bunch of time. Um, Puddle-O, ooh. Uh, is this Puddle-O Crumbs? No? Puddle-O Crumbs. Hi. I've just, first of all, thanks, Puddle-O Crumbs. Oh, my God. My Hi, heart. I just started my sophomore year as of three days ago. What would be Fabian and Adine's advice? Oh my what goodness. is yours? Oh my heart. Uh, wait, pu puddle of crumbs. Everyone else stop talking in the chat. Is this sophomore year of high school or college? No one else chat. Just puddle of crumbs answer the question uh, if, it's, if it's college or high school. It's gotta uh, be high school, right? It's gotta be high school. I potentially, I think so, right? Oh, 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 oh something's Ooh. happening. Ah. Oh. Ah, high, high school. school. Thank you, Puddle of Crumbs. All right, everyone can resume chatting. Uh, first of all, go to bed. <laughs> yes. Don't care. Stay up all night. Have fun with your friends. That's truly my advice. High school doesn't matter. Uh, all of the advice that you get of like, high school matters is incorrect. Uh, follow your passion. Read a lot and have a good time. I don't know. That's it sounds like terrible advice, but truly, I. Uh, I think that the, the schooling system is bad, and uh, if you have a thing that you're passionate about, follow that passion because it's your life, and you have to live it for the rest of your life. Mm. Uh, Fabian's advice is, uh, you know, get out there and make friends. Uh, you know, you may show up to school with one expectation of the person you're going to be, mm -hmm. but the people that you open yourself up to and meet can drastically alter and change that for the better. Yeah. My advice, dude? Oh, <laughs> you got to get that GPA way up, dude. Colleges are important. Start studying for the SAT right, right now. Right now. Get a tutor. Get a tutor. Are you with the Princeton Review? You're not ready. You're not ready. That's it. No. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think 100% uh, resonate with what Siobhan is saying. Of like, uh, this is the beginning. It's the, it, your life is your life, and you have to live it. So do what you want. Yeah. Uh, I would say the exact same thing. Um, I, in my adult life, have never been asked for any. No one has ever asked to see my college degree, no, what my grades anybody were. Anybody who's an adult who still knows what their SAT scores are and tells people about them sucks. Sixteen forty. 
All right. I got a 1640. Yeah, 1640? okay, good. I got a 1640. Really oh, good. I was back I think... in the days when it was capped out at 1600. Yeah, 1640. Yeah, I uh, went to a completely different schooling system, and I did okay. Um, I would say to you, Puddle of Crumbs, uh, I never went to high school, so I don't have any advice about high school or what happens there. And in fact, high schoolers scared me when I was high school age, and they still do. <laughs> what I would say... Uh, what I would say, I have been very clear and upfront about my cowardice from day one. Um, what I would say to you is this. You're, uh, I think that at the age you are at right now, which is what your sophomore year, like 15, 16? 15, 16. Um, it, that was the age that I started working at Wayfinder, which is my LARP summer camp. I started writing a lot of LARPs. And I've always had role playing be a big part of my life. I spent, uh, I was so badly bullied in school that I got taken out of school and I homeschooled for four years from the age of 10 to 14. Uh, I had a hard time. And um, it was a situation where I spent a good part of my early adolescence believing that I would not have friends or, or sort of do stuff in my life. I thought I would maybe like write novels in a shack in the woods and my brother would bring meals to me and that, that would be my, my life. I'm not really exaggerating too much. You do I, live in a shack in the woods. I do still. live in a shack so in the that's, woods. That's, that's well, I will like, say there's something, I mean, this is uh, a sad and uh, heartfelt and powerful thing that you're discussing, but the idea of a 15-year-old child being like, yes, one day I will have a shack and my brother will <laughs> bring <laughs> meals to me in, in my shack. Uh, uh, so the shack thing didn't happen. I went to this summer camp and I started working there and, and um, Role playing through Dungeons and Dragons, through LARPing, through all these sort of tools, um, imparted a lesson that I wish that I wish was like a mandatory lesson for people, and I think is a gift that role playing can teach you, which is something that uh, the the struggle of being a teenager is about moving from childhood where you are just being authentically, mm -hmm. like a five year old just has the personality that erupts from within them and it's out in the world. And then you get to an age of self-awareness where all of a sudden you can, you get the mental ability to self-critique. Mm -hmm. And you move from being someone being careful by your parents to inching towards autonomy and agency. And you start to enter all these profound questions about the world, your place in it, and your identity, who you are going to be. The gift that role playing gave me when I was uh, very sad and not in a good place was this understanding that identity is fluid and that you get to choose who you want to be. Mm -hmm. And that became really that becomes really clear when you're like, I'm a dwarven paladin named Burzo. And the thing to take from that is that's obviously fantastical, but you get to choose if you're brave or not brave. You get to yeah. choose if you care or don't care. And so I think it's not necessarily about high school as the academic institution, which is whatever. It's just that high school is an extension of your life. And the people there present opportunities for you to be the person you want to be, to enter into relationships and friendships with integrity and honor and compassion. And try as much as you can to forge your adult self. That, I didn't know it at the time. But that's the work of being a teenager, mm -hmm. is you're making decisions and forming the ruts and grooves of the paths of your brain into who you want to be. Also, like, fail as much as you can yeah. at as many things as you can, because failure will only teach you who you are and how to be better. Like, I, I think that it, it, you're taught to fear failure so much but failure is not the same thing as losing. It's wild how much the teenagers that I've known in my life fear failure mm -hmm. and reprisal when you are truly at a period of your life where the risks for experimentation are potentially less than they will ever yeah. be. The thing know? that I finally learned when I started working in restaurants uh, that I did not learn all the way through school is that it's not the failure that matters, it's how you deal with it that counts. Yeah. And often you can not only salvage a situation by how you deal with that failure, but you can make it 10 times better. Mm -hmm. And I wish that I had learned that in school and I did not. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, because I had bad teachers who were on my vendetta list. <laughs> I will one day murder. Yeah. 
so uh, Puddle of Crumbs, go, go forward into life. Uh, uh, and, you know, don't be afraid of failure. Experimentation is there. This is an age in your life when you get to decide so many exciting things about who you want to be and what your life can look like. Uh, experiment, fail, rise up again, dust yourself off. And we are speaking with authority because we are Dungeons and Dragons players from the internet. So everything yep. we say yes. should be taken as pure Absolutely. gospel. Mm -hmm. We know everything don't, don't we're talking your parents. about. We're your parents now. <laughs> and just for, so the record, for everyone who's keeping track at home, I uh, spoke incorrectly. I got a 1760 on the SAT. 1760. 1760? Yeah, at way a better than. Yeah, at a, no, at a 2400. Oh, okay. Uh, 1760. I truly don't know what any of these numbers I mean. I think I got a 1450. Oh, and look uh, at that. And the old one in the 1600. I got an A in chemistry, I got a B in English, and I got a C in theater studies. And now I'm a writer. Tom Price gave me a B in history when I was at SUNY Ulster. And Tom Price, <laughs> you robbed me of my 4.0. You know what you did. You know what you did. And you know that I earned that A. So you come find me and you come talk to me. All right? Uh, guys, this has been Extra Credit. Uh, so delightful to have Lou and Siobhan here. Yay! Yay! Uh, uh, tune in next week for our last Extra Credit before the return to Elmville and the world of Spire. Oh, my goodness. What's it going to be? What's it going to be? We genuinely don't know. I genuinely don't know. I genuinely do know. And I'm going to tell you what it's going to be next week. What? What? Bye. Bye. Guys, that's it for this chapter of Dimension 20. But wait, hearken. The cry of more full episodes of Dimension 20. They call out to you from dropout.tv. Will you not run to their aid with your free trial today?